Talking Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radio, a brand new series in which we will be talking to some of the leading lights of the UK radio industry. And today we are at BBC Radio Bristol to speak to the breakfast presenter here, formerly of the parish of BBC Somerset, Emma Britton. Hello, Emma. Hello, James. Now, declaration of interest to begin with. We are colleagues. We and are. Indeed, my first ever proper radio job was as your BA, which is essentially which is broadcast assistant. People in radio will know it, but essentially your slave? Is that no, fair? not no, my it's slave. It's a bit like that. Well, you are a very good slave if Thank you want you. to put it that way. But no, broadcast assistant is a really, really important part um, on the breakfast show in particular because you're part of the glue that holds the breakfast show together. And you were very good, albeit <laughs> a little bit loud at first. I am quite loud. I had to find the volume control, the James Hansen volume control. Mind you, turn you down. Your volume control is about minus six point whatever on the <laughs> on the settings, isn't it? So I am quite loud. You are quite loud as well. People yeah. in glass houses. Um, well, you started out as a BA, and um, we'll come on to how you got into radio in a moment but I have this theory that everyone in radio should start as a BA not really feasible but it does teach you all the skills you need it's such a good grounding absolutely um, it is the bottom rung of the ladder but it's really crucial and I think from there you have a full appreciation of what anyone on the team needs to, to do basically so um, having a really good broadcast assistant helps because that person might be the first point of contact for guests uh, they are making sure that the presenter and the producer are happy making the tea uh, making sure that guests get a good experience and when you were my BA you were reading travel as well not you know not all BAs have to do that so yeah and the presenters who are nicest to their colleagues often have been BAs because they know what it's like. Well, exactly. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. I think the best producers are people who have either, you know, come up through that way or have been presenters themselves because they know what sitting both sides of the glass is like. Well, that brings us on to how you got into radio because it's probably fair to say not a conventional route. You sort of fell into it almost. I was a guest who never went home. So um, I was invited into BBC Somerset in 2003 for a one-off interview about the work I was doing at the time. And I was working as a self-employed freelance specialist fitness instructor. My unique selling point was that I was fat. I'm still fat, I'm just not fit anymore. And that turned into a regular contributor spot once a week, completely unpaid, but great fun. And I did that for four years. And then started doing a bit of casual broadcast assistant work. And then a job came up as a permanent broadcast assistant. And I went for it and um, didn't look back. And I got my full time post with the BBC as a broadcast assistant in 2007. Then, <laughs> in just about 18 months from there, the presenter was sick one day. The cover presenter was on holiday. The person they only used it if they were desperate wasn't on that day, and even the cleaner was off. <laughs> so I had my first go at presenting a radio show, and from then that became regular cover. And then in 2009, I got my own show, the mid-morning show at BBC Somerset. So when you first walked in as a guest yeah. at BBC Somerset, did you at that point think, I'd quite like to do this. Or did you not think about it until they Absolutely invited you back to do more and more? Absolutely not. I had no intention of working in radio. I didn't understand anything about the media. I was running my own business. It was successful. I was self-employed. I was my own boss. I did what I pleased. I, I, I had no intentions of working in radio. Do you think that's a problem in radio that there aren't enough people who maybe had a more unusual route into it like yours i don't think it's a problem but i think people who come in through radio in a natural way like like i did i think um probably bring something different mm -hmm. i approach radio and my program and stories in a bit of a different way mm. and if you put that alongside traditional journalists and people who have done media degrees i think it complements quite nicely so BBC Somerset, you did the mid-morning programme, you did the Saturday mid-morning programme, yep. you also did the breakfast show. Yep. I know it's maybe hard to choose favourites, but in terms of the styles, because the mid-morning shows on most local radio stations is a phone-in, whereas breakfast a bit more newsy, a bit different. Yeah. Did you have one that you felt suited you better? I loved doing the phone-in on mid-morning, um, but after a few years... I felt a bit like I'd done almost every phone-in you could possibly do mm. because there are the same ones that come around, around and again and again and again. Having said that, though, when the opportunity came to move to breakfast, I didn't think it was for me. I didn't think I was a breakfast show presenter. It was all speech, no music, very news-based at the time, and I didn't think that was for me. But 
when I did go for it, I absolutely love the breakfast format. And now I, I think anything else would feel like it wasn't as favourite as breakfast. I, I love the breakfast show format. One of the things that I think marks you out as a presenter, and certainly you started doing at Somerset, was you talked about your life a lot. You talked about your dog, Billy the Beagle, yeah. and he became a bit of a personality. In fact, he's on your publicity shots here at Radio yeah. Bristol. Um, you talked about your partner, John, my John, you talked about your nan, you talked about your mum. Was that just you being natural, or was there a conscious decision of, I'm going to share bits of my life? Because some presenters don't. No, um, not a conscious decision. That was just me being natural. Because for me... The Emma Britton who is on the radio is the same Emma Britton you'll meet in the shop in the, or in the pub or in a restaurant or whatever because that to me being authentic is probably the most important thing. I will talk about pretty much anything in my life. There's one area I've never really talked about and that's I was previously married for a couple of years and, and was divorced so I don't talk about that time of my life for, for personal reasons you know it's not fair on my ex-husband and his his family but that's pretty much the only no-go area and that way I never have to worry about being you know caught out found out and also more importantly when a listener meets me on the street they're not disappointed mm. they meet the person they hear on the radio i've met people i i look up to in the public eye and they've not been quite the same a bit different a little bit different and you're a little bit disappointed mm. So BBC Somerset, you were there over 10 years? Yeah, in total. So I started out as a guest in 2003 and I, I left at the end of, of 2015. Um, uh, so Christmas Day 2015 was my last ever show at BBC Somerset and it was the Christmas Day breakfast show. And you were really the star around which BBC Somerset was built. You were of Somerset, you were a local girl, everyone knew you. Big mutt move to go to BBC Radio Bristol, new patch, new listenership. Yep. Was was that a difficult decision for you to leave the Somerset listenership? Really, um, not a difficult decision because I was ready for a new challenge, but emotionally really hard to let go. Now, I still live in Somerset. It's a 40-minute commute to Radio Bristol, and part of the attraction for me was that I could do that. I could still live in, in my home county, but also still represent the West Country. Because remember, BBC Radio Bristol isn't just about the city of Bristol. It represents yeah. a huge you know, patch, South Gloucestershire, North Somerset, Bath as well. So it was important I could be authentic here, but it was really important to me to live where I love and where my family and friends are as well. So, um, yeah, that it, for me, it was more like the emotional attachment to Somerset. Um, that was what was hard. Now, this is the stage of the interview where I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions. OK. You don't have to give quick fire answers. You can just give honest answers. But uh, moving away from your career, just general thoughts on radio, radio okay. things in general. So, oh, gosh. First of all, all time radio hero. Oh, my goodness. Um, there are lots of people I rate. Um, I'm a big fan of Stephen Nolan. I yes. just, I just, he's ge he's genuine, he's authentic, he's brave. Um, he's also, in my personal opinion, a bit of a workaholic. So, you know, I'm <laughs> yeah, not a fan yeah. of that because I'm really, it's really important to me that you get a work-life balance. But um, I met him once on a training course and I was really inspired by him because he is passionate about making radio for the listener. Uh, other than Radio Bristol, and I'm also going to exclude BBC Somerset in this as well, which other stations do you listen to in your free time? Okay, so I listen to Radio 2 on my way home at lunchtime. I catch the sort of second hour of Jeremy Vine. Uh, then I tend to switch to Five Live and listen to Afternoon Edition, because I'm listening to sort of speech-based radio programmes. Yeah, things programs. you might get an idea from, yep. competition. Yeah, um, and then apart from that, at weekends, if I get the opportunity to listen to radio I'm, I try and like go online and use the iPlayer and listen to other programs I don't know why I just sort of want to make sure that you know I'm getting it right and maybe see what other people are doing but if I'm just out and about in the car I will flick I'll flick between stations you know whether it's one two four radio five local commercial stations I will flick depending on my mood uh, this is an interesting one your biggest radio bugbear Either of your own or of other presenters? Oh, just the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, list as many as you like. Okay. People who say, joining me now, <laughs> I started by asking, <laughs> live, joining me live, as opposed to someone joining me dead. Uh, people who say, a little earlier, or in, all those kind of things, those radio cliches. cliches. Mm. 
I, I, I like to think I don't do them because they're a big bugbear of mine. I probably did them when I first started out. But yeah, um, people who do radio speak, you know, mm. coming up to the top of the hour. Journalese um, almost. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I, I would rather we talk to people normally try and talk to people normally yeah. but we all fall into those habits i someone could probably go and find loads of examples of me doing those radio cliches but but that's my my sort of bugbear if you could have a go for a day presenting a completely different show on a completely different station what show would it be well, like a dream show like yeah a bit like a dream show it could be a show that's out there now or if you could do any other type of show i'd love to do jeremy vine's lunchtime show on radio too i love it i love the fact they can ask any question whatsoever and the phones will ring because their audience is so huge. I was driving in my car one day and Jeremy Vine asked the question, have you ever had your eyes pecked out by a bird? <laughs> And I went, oh, that is never, that is ridiculous. That's never going to work. The, the, the calls they had of people, just unbelievable. Because, and it made me realise, like, when you've got an audience of millions, there are always going to be stories about pretty much anything. And so I'd love the chance to do that, to know you could ask any question, the, the, no matter how random it is, and there'll be people with stories. Have you ever corpsed on air really badly so you've completely lost it? Yeah, yeah quite a few times. Was there one occasion in particular? I think the really bad one was when I couldn't pronounce the word falafel. <laughs> um, <laughs> so simple. And I literally went and, and lost it. Um, <laughs> what else have I done? I once had to read out uh, a what's on about a um, photographic club's members evening. <laughs> oh, God. And even though it makes me giggle. <laughs> Very inappropriate, and I, I had very inappropriate thoughts about what what the photographs were of. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, uh, there are they tend to be silly, childish things and mispronunciations. I laugh quite a lot on the radio. I also <laughs> sneeze a lot on the radio. You do. I you don't do know why. Day. I sneeze all the time. <laughs> and someone once told me, someone senior once told me, if you sneeze on live radio, then you're too relaxed and you're not paying attention enough. But you can't, if a sneeze, if a sneeze is going to happen, a sneeze is going to happen. <laughs> uh, final one in quick fire. Strangest thing you've ever done because of the radio? Oh my goodness me. I've done lots of really unusual things. I've flown a hovercraft, driven a steam engine. Uh, what else have I done? Oh, sheared a sheep. Um, I've, I've castrated a lamb. I've done loads of different random things which I would have never have done ever if I hadn't have worked in radio. Uh, coming on to sort of questions of style and presenting style and that kind of thing, some presenters would always say they have one listener in mind yep. when they're broadcasting. I think Joe Wiley says that she always thinks of a trucker who's driving along and, and listening to her. Do you have, do you think of one person when you're presenting? When I was at BBC Somerset. I always thought of my mum because my mum is really target demographic audience. She's, she ticks all the boxes. Moving to BBC Radio Bristol, I haven't, f I don't think I've quite fixed mm. on my one listener yet because the audience is different. Yeah. But all I am thinking about always is a listener because I, I probably upset people by saying this, but I think there are some people in the industry who make radio for their own egos mm. rather than for the person listening. And I think, you know, we are, we make radio for other people, not for ourselves. Mm. So I'm always thinking of the listener. But what I'll always do is look through the glass, look through to the team. And if I say something and they make a face, whether it's like, or, <laughs> or, oh, like that, yeah. I know I've hit the spot. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking about as well. You've been in radio now over 10 years, mm -hmm. local radio. How has it changed in that time? Oh, it's changed massively and I've worked out, because bear in mind I had no radio history, that it's quite cyclical as mm. well. So when I was in mid-morning and moving into breakfast, breakfast still had very much a news brief, news, news, news. We've now moved into the era of personality, which thankfully that's what I was doing already. I was being myself and, you know, and I was... I was still doing the news, but I was bringing that element of personality to it. So I haven't struggled so much with that. I reckon there'll come a time when we bring music onto breakfast shows. I'm sure that will happen. I don't know. I don't know. If we play music, where will there be any time for talking? <laughs> On a bank holiday, we play music. There's no time for talking. Um, so that might happen. So I've seen quite a few changes. And obviously, you know, social media has come on since I've been a radio presenter, which I love using, but at the same time can bring with it its downsides as well. Massive, massive changes. 
hold that thought because I want to chat to you a bit more about the future of radio in a moment. But uh, it is time for what may become a regular feature. Uh, cameraman Andy Bennett, who is the producer of this programme, is now going to ask a question off mic, Steve Wright styley. Uh, <laughs> Andy, what's your question? Steve Wright styley, I like it. Emma, tell us the time you were involved in innuendo bingo. Oh, goodness. On radio, I think I've been on innuendo bingo twice that I know of <laughs> with Greg James. Um, but they don't tell you you're going to appear. I still haven't quite worked out how they know. They, they have spies and people that send things in. And the only reason I know I've appeared on innuendo bingo is because my phone goes crazy. <laughs> my, I must have loads of really young people who I know who listen to Radio 1. They go, we just heard you on Radio 1. So the most uh, the most funny one was when I did an item on BBC Somerset about cavity wall insulation. Very important and how it's very important, James. Stop laughing. It's very important and how you could get a grant for cavity wall insulation if you qualified, blah, blah, blah. So did a very important interview, you know, public service, etc, etc. And um, at the end of it, and the thing is with me, I don't realise I'm doing it. The innuendos just seem to occur naturally. I don't realise I'm doing it. So I said, so, um, it's, you know, if you are eligible uh, for this scheme, here's the number that you need to call, etc, uh, etc. Et and you never know, you could have a man round to fill your cavities. <laughs> and I hit the, um, the jingle and off we went and I didn't really think anything of it <laughs> that was what they put on innuendo bingo I can't good, remember good who question, was playing <laughs> can't remember who was playing and you know whatever but <laughs> to appear on radio one you know I'm, I'm 42 now for goodness sake you know I'm, my days of radio one are long gone hey Annie know? Nightingale well yeah, oh yeah but you have to be you know a certain age and cool and I'm definitely not cool <laughs> maybe cool for bridge water yeah just yeah. about uh, so coming back to sort of the future of the radio industry it's very hard to sort of speculate about where we'll be in 10 years time because half the people wouldn't have predicted where we are now 10 Absolutely. years ago. But do you think there are certain things that you can start to see now that you think that will be where radio is heading? Well, I'm mainly selfishly thinking about local radio. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I really feel passionately that as a, as a public service broadcaster, local radio is essential. We provide a service to you know a certain demographic of of the community that i don't think are going to go elsewhere even though we've got social media and internet radio and and digital where you can listen to what you know whatever you want so i, I really do believe that local radio will stay personally and that's not just because i want to you know keep broadcasting mm. um but i i don't know i think what people need and want will change i mean you know, smartphones weren't around sort of seven or eight years ago. Social media definitely wasn't around. My mum's a keen Facebook user. My 85-year-old nan uses Facebook, you know. So I, I just think there'll be changes around, you know, how we serve our audience. But I really, if, if local radio was to ever disappear, then I think that would be Emma Britton disappearing because I don't think I could do anything else. I'm too old for Radio 1. You seem to need to have a famous profile to be on Radio 2. I'm definitely not posh enough for four, and I'm still not sure what they do on three. So five, five live. Well, five, yeah. But I mean, the number of people that would love to work for Five Live. Bear in mind, you know, I'm I'm one BBC local radio breakfast presenter. There are another 39 or even more with double-headed presentation shows. Then all the mid-morning presenters. Then all the drive presenters. You know, we're a lot of fish, you know, swimming in a really big pond. But you know, I would love to work for Five Live. But you know, I'm I'm a real List, so. And are you in radio now for life as long as they'll have you or because you've done a lot of jobs before and, <laughs> and you've done this job probably longer than you've done any other job. Is this now your vocation for the rest of your life? Longest time I've ever stayed in a job and I've had a lot of jobs in my time so that says something. I'll have been yeah uh, 10 years as a full-time employee next year but obviously I was going into BBC Somerset for a good four years before that. Um, so I would like to think so but I'm a big I'm very much aware that I am one sentence away from the sack. <laughs> I present two and a half hours of all speech radio every weekday morning and I get up very early. One day, it, the, 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 you know, the stars and the moons are going to line up and I'm going to say something I regret. Probably if you start talking about cavities again. Yeah, well, it'll be the cavities. But, you know, you just don't know. I think you're very vulnerable in radio. You know, we've seen some really big names fall from grace, you know. So I'm mindful of that. Um, but I'm also mindful that life has a really strange way of throwing, you know, curveballs at you. So I try not to think too long term because you just don't know what's around the corner. But I'll stay as long as they'll 
have me. <laughs> and as long as the Rage Off figures are all right, obviously. Well, for what it's worth, I don't think you're going anywhere. Other than you. you've got to go and pick up your dog, Billy the Beagle. So well, yeah, there are us. important things in life. Indeed. But, um, yeah, thank you very much. Not at all. On that note, thank you so much for being our first guest on Talking Radio. Thank you. <laughs> Talking Radio.